Hello everybody, welcome to episode of number five of PASS. Uh, today I'm here at CRC again uh, with Professor Lisa Beebe, who is a music history uh, professor. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kash. It's great to be here. Yes. So we're here in the CRC uh, Music Lab. Uh, we'll start. We'll mm -hmm. start with this. Uh, what's the? It's, it's a new lab. When I was here, it wasn't here. Yeah. So what's the? Uh, uh, we use this new lab. And what's the purpose of this lab? Yeah. So this is our brand new state-of-the-art keyboard lab. Uh -huh. um, it was installed during uh, shelter in place, so it's brand new. Uh, yeah. We got it during quarantine and. It's really exciting to be able to offer classes in here. So yeah. um, these are all new, uh, brand new keyboards and iPad workstations, and they're all connected to a network. Yeah. So when we have piano courses in uh -huh. here, um, you can play the keyboard and wear the headphones, and you only hear yourself, so you can mess up and yeah. no one will hear you. Um, but then the teacher can tune in and hear you, yeah. or can pair you up with another student to play duets. I see. So. It's a great classroom, um, and we use this for our beginning, intermediate, and advanced piano classes, and uh -huh. those are um, available to everyone. So if anybody's wanted to ever learn to play the piano, yeah. it's an amazing way to study with a teacher at a really, really affordable cost. Yeah. Um, I'm taking beginning piano this semester and okay. having a wonderful time <laughs> and learning so much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to... Um, be able to use this room. This is also where music theory classes meet and musicianship classes. Um, so it's a really great, great space, and we're really thankful to have it here at CRC. That's nice. Uh, can I talk about some of the classes that you're teaching right now in this semester? Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm a music history professor here yeah. at CRC. So I teach um, uh, rock and roll, uh, in intro to music, history of rock and roll, um, survey of music, and there are two classes in that sequence. Okay. There's ancient to 1750 and 1750 to the present. Mm -hmm. um, I also teach intro to music, which is like more of a general survey class. Um, and then I also teach world music, of course, yeah. and you were in my world music class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And then uh, like, I talked to my professor in uh, his, uh, acting classes, and they always talk about how this year has been quite good. They've got a lot of students in acting class courses. Mm -hmm. And when I was with uh, you in the world music class, there was, there was quite, a, quite a lot of students in the class. But I just want to know how maybe COVID has affected it, or in general, how where do you think the music department is going? Is it growing, and mm -hmm. what's the I guess number of students that are coming in? Yeah, so enrollment following um, sort of the height of COVID has been challenging at CRC as a whole and at colleges and universities okay. yeah. sort of across the United States. And I talked to colleagues and friends who work at other schools who all kind of shared similar stories and. I think part of that has to do with people feeling reticent to come back you yeah. know, after the height of COVID, which is totally understandable. Yeah. Um, but that being said, we're starting to see increasing enrollment in our music courses. Students are excited to be back in ensembles, excited to be back learning instruments, learning piano. Yeah. Um, one way I would say that COVID has sort of opened a new direction for the music department is we are teaching more classes online. Mm -hmm. Some classes, of course, make more sense meeting in person, like um, orchestra, for example, yeah. or jazz band, um, piano, yeah. the music theory courses. But we also have some courses like history of rock and roll or world music that do really well in person and do really well online. Okay. And so that's been kind of, for me personally, an exciting new direction is developing um, some materials for online classes yeah. that can be really meaningful and useful for students. So I think that is sort of one new direction that um, COVID opened up for us. Yeah. And then yeah. also uh, one of the challenging things always as a uh, as an art professor is usually and again, I asked the question to Ryan as well, is when students come into your class, sometimes they just come as like a GE requirement fulfillment. Like that, that, that's, how, that's how I initially came as well, just because my GE is done. Yeah. But so like, what do you, like, of course, you want to teach them your subject material, but what else, else are you also hoping that they also learn, even though that person may not end up pursuing anything in the field of art, mm -hmm. what are you expecting that individual to get out of the class, even though, they're in, even though that's not the main field? That's a great question, yeah. yeah. You know, even if a student is maybe, if, let's say, taking world music with me, yeah. pathology, and that's the only music class they're going to take, I still think it's super important for students to take a music class or to take a music history class as part of your education because music is a human activity. Yeah. And by studying music, we're not just studying the notes or the sounds. 
but we're also studying who created that music, um, what, is it, what does that music mean within a particular culture, how has that changed over time, um, sort of what does it reflect about the society that, it, that it's coming from. Yeah. And so all of those things and learning how to ask all of those questions, um, it's super valuable and it applies not just to music but to a whole bunch of other fields. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had students say that, you know, oh, I'm you know, learning to uh, be a teacher. Yeah. And so now that I know about this particular type of music, I'm going to incorporate it into my yeah. classroom. Um, or, you know, I'm going to learn to play this instrument. Or sometimes it's really great. It's like I studied music from my heritage and it allowed me to connect with my grandma, yeah. you know, something yeah. like that. So um, that's why I think music is super important. I'm always really happy at the end of the semester when a student will tell me, I didn't realize there was going to be so much about studying music, <laughs> you know, that there's yeah. so much to it. Um, so yeah, it's really rewarding for me when everybody, anybody takes yeah. a class, you know, music majors, but anyone, yeah. And then you also, you also get to learn about different, different cultures as well, They're studying mm -hmm. about different cultures of music. So I was going to ask about uh, certain classes have, like, when you walk in, they have sort of music playing. And or when, or when, or during the class, they might play a little light music in the background. Uh, how much impact do you think, or how much uh, more can we incorporate music into normal classes? Would that be mm -hmm. impactful for students' learning or the mental like uh, awareness in the classroom? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways for teachers of any subject and at any level to incorporate music into their class. Um, so one way, yeah, is to have music playing when students come in. Yeah. And I know some of my colleagues at CRC, one thing that they'll do is at the beginning of the semester, they'll ask students, you know, what's your favorite song? What's a song yeah. you really like? And they make a playlist. And then throughout the semester, they'll play those songs. So it's really nice. You come yeah. in one day and your song is oh, playing, yeah. right? And it just kind of helps create a sense of belonging and community in a class, which means a lot yeah. um, because when you feel like you belong in a class, you're more invested in it. Yeah. If you hit a rough patch and you're struggling, yeah. you're more likely to then go to the professor or go to a tutor for help. Yeah. Um, so that's just one way. Um, there are also ways to make up songs to help remember things. Yeah. So you can use music <laughs> as a mnemonic yeah. device. Um, also, you know, music for stressful situations. So sometimes if it's possible, if students are open to it, um, letting students listen to calming music while taking a test mm -hmm. or working on an exam, yeah. for example, if, if that's possible. Uh, so those are just some ways. Or when studying like in a, a history class or a literature class, studying a particular era or a time period, um, playing music from mm -hmm. that time and place in history can just kind of be a nice way to round it out too. Uh, and I know those are just some things colleagues at CRC have shared with me that they do. So, yeah, yeah definitely able to incorporate music into, yeah. into everything. <laughs> also, one of the things that I remember from your class being is that, like, you almost never, like, even raised your voice towards the students, right? It was mm -hmm. also very calming. Obviously, I think it's different between high school and college. College, kids are slightly more, like, if, if they don't want to go to class, they just won't go show up to class. But even, even then, there's a sense of, like, uh, almost very... Uh, you were like very really approachable in a sense of professor. How do you create that uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a classroom? Even though it's a college classroom, it's a sudden, it's different from like a high school or mm -hmm. other schools. But there's, a, there's approachability as a professor. As a college student, when I'm going to a classroom, there is also like a sense of like a fear, like how do I approach the professor, right? Yeah. So how do you create the comfort in a classroom, especially when it's so important, because especially music, uh, when you play, there was a test we used to have, you, you gotta listen to the music and respond question, right? That can be quite yeah. challenging for students. So, yeah. how, so it's important to interact with the professor. So how do you create an environment in that sense for music class? Yeah, so I think having a calm and approachable environment is super important to having a productive experience yeah. in the classroom. So, and it's something, you know, I'm continuing, continuing yeah. to learn about. It's a process. Um, but some of the things that I've learned work really well um, are, yeah, keeping a calm tone, yeah. you know, um, not feeling rushed. So if we're running out of time that day, I'm not going to step on the gas and rush through the rest okay, of the yeah. material. We'll just save it for next time. It'll be fine. Yeah. We'll get to it when we get to it, you know. And something that um, I think has helped uh, too is just trying to teach the topics that I'm most excited about. Yeah. And whatever I teach, I try to find 
even if it's maybe not my favorite type of music, right? Mm -hmm. Something I like about it because that enthusiasm I think comes through and is kind of infectious. And it's also, it's okay to not like a style of music. Nobody yeah, likes yeah, everything. Yeah, That's maybe. cool. Um, but at the same time, when we're studying music, the goal is even if maybe we don't like a certain style, mm -hmm we can at least find something we appreciate about it or that's interesting. Yeah. It doesn't mean we have to go home and listen to it all the yeah. time. Um, yeah, and I, so I think all those things are important. And going into the classroom, now I'm kind of a shy person yeah. myself, <laughs> um, and I often get, uh, especially at the beginning of the semester, like really nervous before class starts. I actually get really anxious about talking in front of people yeah. and meeting new people. So a lot of the strategies that I use to help myself stay calm, it okay. turns out also help <laughs> everyone stay yeah. calm um, and then just make it more enjoyable. You know, I think one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from a teacher, I, oh, I was about to teach um, a new class at a new school. I was super nervous. Mm -hmm. And my mentor was like, okay, well, just remember to like your students. Yeah. Remember you like them. Yeah. Remember to tell them and show them that you like them. That'll help you feel more comfortable. It'll help them feel more comfortable. Everybody will have a better time. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, it sounds really simple, but yeah. that one little piece of advice really opened the door to a lot. Yeah. And did you always want to be a teacher, like, growing up? Oh, yeah. I remember, you know, as a kid, playing school with my friends and okay. giving each other homework. <laughs> and Oh, gosh, yeah. And, um, I loved it. When I was a kid, I either wanted to be a teacher or I wanted to be a librarian. Oh, okay. um, and then for a while, kind of in high school, I changed my mind. I thought maybe I'd be more interested in science or engineering, yeah. really wasn't sure. Um, but then when I started college, I realized that all the classes I was excited about were all music classes, oh, were all music history classes. Yeah. Um, so I kind of tried to lean into that passion. Um, I didn't actually, Think. I mean, I had music professors, so yeah. I knew you could be a music history professor, but I didn't really think I could be a music history professor. Mm -hmm. It just was never something that occurred to me um, until uh, my senior year. I had to do a senior project, okay. and I was just I was just really proud of in it. College? Like, in college, oh, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I was really proud of it. It was a um, from a music history major, and I just I spent a lot of time on it. I was yeah. like, I want to do something with this, yeah, you yeah. know. So um, my mentor, my advisor was like, well, why don't you look into conferences? Okay. Um, there are student conferences you can go to. Um, so I went online and kind of dug around and I found out there was this graduate student conference. Yeah. I was like, well, I'll apply because I'm not yeah. a grad student, but like yeah. maybe they'll say yes. And they did. And I okay. got to go and I met graduate students in music and it just really opened my mind to what was out there. And yeah. so then, um, yeah, that was kind of the, the beginning of that path. It was really exciting, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, when you want asking, uh, mm -hmm. what college did you end up going to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm from Ohio. I grew up in Cleveland. Oh, okay. Um, and so I went to, it's called Hiram College. Okay. Um, it's a small school, about 45 minutes east of Cleveland. Yeah. And when I was looking at colleges, um, that was one that I just felt uh, really excited about. Yeah. I met with one of the music professors and, um, and you know, college is expensive, yeah. right? So I didn't know if I was gonna be able to go, but um, thankfully I was able to get a scholarship that made it possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was really exciting. Yeah, it was, um, you know, looking at colleges, looking back on it now, there was so much I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everybody though. You know, yeah, <laughs> I look back at it, like, it could have been a lot better. <laughs> right, you just kind of figure it yeah. out as you go. And um, am I, I'm the first person in my family to finish college. Oh, okay. And so um, there was kind of a lot to figure out and uh, navigate, but I was really lucky to have some great advisors and okay. great professors who kind of helped me along the way and then inspired me to become a better teacher. Yeah. And yeah, you say you had like a passion for the music in your classes. Mm -hmm. Why specifically music history and not like music theory or like a specific instrument? Why did you go towards history? Yeah, you know, did you ever learn something or you study something and then all of a sudden yeah. you like kind of get excited? Yeah. Like maybe your heart beats a little bit faster or yeah. you get super focused. Uh, for me, that was always music history. Like okay. hearing a piece of music and learning about who wrote it, who was listening to it, what types of instruments were they yeah. playing? Like. 
those are just the kinds of questions that excite me. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I have colleagues and friends who, what excites them is figuring out in a piece of music, ooh, what's going on harmonically? I you see, know, yeah. what's the theoretical underpinnings yeah. of this? Um, and then there are folks that playing it gives them that yeah. joy. So I don't know why that just um, yeah. that just gets me excited. Those are the types of questions that get me excited about music. Yeah. And I do play music. I mm. play the viola. Um, okay. and like I said, I'm learning to play piano. Yeah. But for me, performance has always been something I enjoy doing with friends, I, I with a small group. Yeah. Um, I like if I'm going to perform, I like being part of an orchestra. Performing by myself makes me incredibly nervous, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't particularly enjoy it, I and see, yeah. so I haven't really pursued that as much. <laughs> and uh, even uh, talking about like music history-wise, uh, like what has been like one of those? Cause we talk about different different cultures, right? What's been mm -hmm. like one of the same music uh, different type? What type of music recently have you been really like attracted to? There's something mm -hmm. that I'm listening to right now. It's like, oh, there's something I really like. Yeah. So every time I teach a, a class, I sort of get pulled into the music we're studying in that class. Yeah. Um, and so right now, um, one of the classes I'm teaching is Survey of Music History and Literature 1750 to the Present. Okay. And uh, this is my first time since COVID teaching this class in person mm -hmm. again. Yeah. So I'm spending a lot of time kind of preparing for it, adding new things, changing it yeah. up, right? So I listen to a lot of music that um, either we're studying in that class or that I'm considering bringing into the class. Okay. And so that's a lot of um, you know, classical music from the 18 and 1900s yeah. from Europe, from North America. Um, also spending a lot of time learning more about um, quali. Okay, yeah. Um, because that's a style of music we study in world music and yeah. in, in music history. Um, so learning more about tabla yeah. right, and harmonium, and I actually have those instruments now, yeah. so kind of figuring them out. Uh, for fun, when I'm listening to music, um, sometimes <laughs> when I'm feeling, it depends on my mood, yeah. right? I always tell my students, they're like, what's your favorite kind of music? It depends on my mood. And when I'm feeling kind of just like anxious or stressed, uh -huh. it's so funny. I go back and I listen to music from like the late 90s, early 2000s. That's oh, okay. like my comfort blanket music. <laughs> So I've been listening to a lot of that recently just because yeah. it's a stressful time in the semester. Yeah. Um, but then I also discover new music too. So I've been trying to learn more about jazz. Mm -hmm. um, so listening to more jazz artists. Um, when students bring music into class, like they'll share a song by an yeah. artist they like, then I end up going back and listening to more of that artist too. Yeah. So yeah, kind of always, always changing. It's interesting, you know, I'm always interested in learning about new music, listening to new music. Yeah but also love going back to my comfort yeah. albums. <laughs> Everybody does. So, yeah. <laughs> Is there a specific quality person that you listen to? Um, yes. So we've been studying... Um, mm, okay, that's not his name. Uh, uh, Nusra... Yes. Akbar Khan. Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, he's considered the greatest yeah. 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 yeah, my friend who is more knowledgeable than me was like, yeah, this is the song yeah. you should choose. This is the artist. And so yeah. um, we listened to Alahu in the world music. Yeah, okay, yeah. Alahu, because I found a video on YouTube that has uh, English translation of the lyrics. Yeah. And so that's where we listened to that one. Um, and one thing uh, I did notice in our world music class as well, when we, when we went across mul multiple cultures and artists, mm -hmm. uh, it was most of the uh, compositions and most of the stuff were it was usually done by like male artists. Mm -hmm. I know, we, I know we, did, we did come across Lata Mangeshkar, she's the one mm -hmm. of those ones. But even then, even in our culture, we, we look at uh, Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, so we, we call it, mm -hmm. this is in the front of his name, we put a star, like a, like a master, right? right. Yeah. We don't put that same thing for like a female artist even though she's like this is a great great artist herself mm -hmm. learning about music history and what have you i guess learned about like gender roles between mm -hmm. music and how it has it changed or how has it not changed yeah yeah that's a good question you know that's something we recently talked about in the music history class mm -hmm. we spent a few weeks talking about um race and gender and ethnicity and yeah. music history and um yeah, it's interesting because oftentimes, you know, gender roles are, are different depending on the culture and yeah. different depending on the historical period. 
but we do notice some similarities, right, in terms of um, sort of patriarchal organization. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we do find that in music from around mm. the world, around with history. And sometimes that can be really, um, you know, we have to talk about it in yeah. class, right? Um, when it's a culture outside of my own, I'm still trying to approach that culture, that music with respect, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so usually just kind of mention the fact like, okay, you know, in, in this particular um, tradition, you know, we don't see as many women musicians yeah. or women musicians taking the lead. Okay. Um, and then if possible, maybe we will study a tradition yeah. that involves women musicians. Um, and this is something that we see kind of across cultures and in different time periods too, where women have been discouraged from public music performance. Yeah but are very much encouraged to be uh, active with music in the private sphere. Okay, so in yeah. the home, yeah. for example. Um, and so thinking about music history and, and thinking about you know, music more broadly, um, not valuing public performance yeah. more than private performance. I see. Um, and understanding that they're both really meaningful. And that's something that, especially in Western music history, has tended to happen. Yeah. Like history books talk more about compositions that were performed yeah. in a concert hall, right? Yeah. And oftentimes those were then performed by, or written by male musicians. Yeah. So we have to spend the time and do the work to find out, okay, well, what was going on outside the public sphere, I right? See. And that's happened a lot, I think, in terms of European music history. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't always, in colleges and universities, spend the time um, doing that same type of work or highlighting that same work yeah. outside of Western music history. So that's something I'm trying to do better about. Yeah. Um, and the ways that I can do better about it are uh, asking people who are experts okay. um, yeah. on those cultural musics mm -hmm. or who have spent years researching them. Hey, I'm teaching this class. Yeah. You know, what could I do? What could I bring in to this um, into this class, right? Like, which musician should we talk about? Yeah. Do you know any videos? That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a work in progress. And I think that that's something that's gotten easier kind of the longer I've been mm -hmm. teaching. Yeah. When I first started, I just felt like, and this was, this was a while ago, this is gonna be like 10 years ago. Right. But when I first started teaching, I was like, all right, I gotta go in and I have to be the most knowledgeable person in the room, yeah. right? And if, if students think I don't know something, they won't think I'm credible. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the way, I realized that not only was that not true, but it wasn't sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to burn myself yeah. out and make everybody have yeah. a bad time. It's okay to not know things. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, that's a great question. Let's find out. Yeah. Let's go find the answer. Um, it's okay to continuously revise materials and bring in new ideas and maybe not get it perfect right yeah. the first time. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all part of the journey. <laughs> And also speaking about music, uh, we know uh, colonialization has obviously had a huge impact on the music as well. We see like a uh, harmonium being brought to the country like India, right? And even now, in generally, uh, music is becoming a little more globalized. Mm -hmm. And what do you think uh, perhaps are like the, I guess, pros and cons of it? I know there's like an obvious con will be that, okay, Western music is kind of dominating towards it. Mm -hmm. But there's also can be pros as well of globalization. We see a bunch, a lot of... Uh, music from, especially I know from for myself, South, South East, Asia, East Asian music coming towards the West as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's the pros and cons of it? Yeah, that's a good point. And you know, globalization, like, like you said, and colonization, that's something that's been going on for hundreds of yeah. years. But I think maybe we're more aware or attuned to it now because with the internet, yeah. things like YouTube, Spotify, streaming, whatever. Um, it's easier to access yeah. music, although then it's also easier for things to get lost in the yeah. shuffle, <laughs> right? Um, so it'll be interesting to see kind of how this unfolds. I think something that's all, kind of always a question, right, with globalization or, or colonization and in terms of the arts or in terms of music yeah. is it's great to be inspired by another culture's yeah. music, right? Um, to be inspired by the sound of a particular instrument or the work of a musician, that's great. Yeah. Um, I think where things start to get sticky is who's profiting, yeah. you know, who's making money off of this. So mm -hmm. for example, if an artist who has maybe more cultural capital and more economic means takes a sample yeah. from a Southeast Asian artist and mm -hmm. then puts that in their music and then they make all the money from see, yeah. its streams, 
and that artist isn't credited, mm -hmm. or maybe they're credited, but they're not receiving any monetary recompense from their yeah. work, that's where we start to see, see some issues, yeah. right? That's where we're kind of veering towards cultural appropriation mm -hmm. rather than cultural appreciation. Yeah. Um, and that's something that's been going on, again, for hundreds of yeah. years, if not more, um, and is continuing today. I, I think that one of the ways we can try to push back on that is by incorporating music education in our yeah. schools and having classes like world music and creating listeners who ask those types of questions. Yeah. You know, where is this music coming from? Um, who's been credited for their work? Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see you know, what what's next. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to clarify, uh, you yeah. said it's been happening for 100 years. This is, mm -hmm. it's also true for prior to colonialization too, right? Uh, music of like mixing together. Yeah, so for example, um, when I was saying 100 years, I was just thinking of, uh, for example, like French composer Claude Debussy was very much interested in um, uh, Indonesian gamelan okay. or different musical styles from Asia mm -hmm. and would then incorporate those into his musical compositions. Yeah. Um, or even if we go as far back as Mozart, for example, okay. um, would incorporate Turkish Janissary music or kind of this, what he thought that music sounded yeah. like um, into his uh, Turkish march, for mm -hmm. example. Um, so we see composers in Europe being interested in music from other parts of the world, um, oftentimes where things get sticky um, is when they'll create sort of caricatures of that music or sort of like this is what we think that music sounds okay, like yeah, it doesn't actually yeah. right or um, we're not you know crediting who we learned this yeah. particular thing from um, also you know music is a wonderful thing music like anything any other art form can also be used as a form of propaganda music yeah. can be used to create stereotypes yeah. of people and propagate those stereotypes um, uh, for example, in music history, we were just learning about minstrelsy, which was a style of popular music in the United States um, just after the Civil War. Yeah. And minstrelsy often featured singer, white singers wearing blackface, and oh, they would yeah. perform songs that were demeaning to African Americans mm -hmm. and sort of perpetuated these yeah. stereotypes. Um, and a lot of those songs are still around today. They're still taught in schools. That history is just kind of been swept under the rug maybe a few lyrics are changed yeah. and, and that's it right and so it's ways that like that music like many other forms of art can be used as a form of propaganda mm -hmm. and then sort of just infused into a yeah. culture um, without its history being known um, so those are just a, a couple yeah. of examples um, so yeah it's, it's all the more reason why music history classes are important yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, its role in like nationalism as well, mm. creating a strong national I identity. And that's why I like kind of continue the same question is, what do you think the responsibility of like an artist should be like as an artist? Should I be aware of the type of music I'm making? Obviously, there's gonna be money involved as well. But where's the resp how much of the responsibility lies within the, within the artist mm. in terms of creating such music that I guess creates propaganda or whatnot? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, hmm. Yeah, oftentimes artists today, I mean, when you're creating music in your home studio yeah. and you're putting it on YouTube, um, I guess some ways, you know, to be a responsible artist are if you are sampling someone else or yeah. using someone else's work, um, just to make sure that you're giving them credit, okay. you know, whether that's... Um, so just off the top of my head, I was saying Beyonce came mm -hmm. out uh, with a recent album um, that's really dance inspired. Okay. And so on some of the tracks on that album, um, Renaissance, she'll mm -hmm. credit artists that she sampled. Mm -hmm. She'll also credit artists that inspired a particular aspect of that sound. Okay, yeah. So if you look at the songwriting credits on Renaissance, sometimes there's like 20 different artists Actually, listed, yeah. right? Um, and that was one way that she credited and paid homage yeah. to kind of this genre of music, of dance music, um, that she was creating in her album. So that's just one way, yeah. and that's Beyonce. Um, <laughs> the rest of us non-Beyoncés out there, um, yeah, we can credit where we get samples from if we do that. Um, uh, other ways, um, I mean, it's always good to cite your sources, yeah. right? Uh, whether that's in 
in music or in art or in writing, um, avoid plagiarizing or taking other people's work. Um, also, I guess you know, just being conscious of is there any way that this music could be used to harm people? I mean, for new music, not necessarily. I would think if maybe you were a musician and you were playing music of the past, mm -hmm. it'd be really important to know about the context yeah. of that music and then deciding whether or not you still want to perform it. Yeah. I'm not saying like that it's always wrong to perform music of the past that maybe had some nationalistic or um, you know, ethnocentric yeah. um, context from the past. You may or may not want to perform it today, but at the very least, you, you want to understand that context yeah. and maybe contextualize it for your listeners yeah. too. Um, so yeah, just cultivating a sense yeah. of awareness. And that's, that's how I'm trying to get, in, get at a little bit more as well. Because we talk about like music being used for like lullabies for babies to sleep mm -hmm. and whatnot. It's, it's a very powerful tool as well. Yeah. So was, and, and my question was always like, uh, in terms of the impact it can have on the on, on the community, the responsibility, let's say I'm making like a, I don't want to get too <laughs> controversial, but like uh, there's, the, in our in our culture, uh, in our back home, there's mm -hmm. a huge talk about gun culture being promoted, right? But through music. And, and, mm -hmm. people, and one of the arguments that will always be, always be presented is look in movies, there's always guns and stuff like that. But I guess uh, my uh, counter argument with that today would be there's always context in terms of movies and where in uh, music there sometimes can be lost lost of context mm -hmm. when you listen to music there's no context in in what way the artist trying to um, portray a certain thing and that's what I was trying to get to like how can artists also be able to portray that con I know right nowadays the music videos they mm -hmm. help as well with it but should there be like a like a rating on the like 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 that mm -hmm. movie that like PG rated or R rated should they be for music as well? I think now it's almost like they bleep out the cuss words, but the rest of the music still stays, right? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. And you know, there was a rating system um, court case in the 1980s okay. in the United States. It was um, an organization called the Parents Music Resource Center. Mm -hmm. And they um, brought this court case against the Recording uh, Industry Association of America, the RAA. Yeah. And the court ultimately ruled that record labels didn't have to put a warning label. Okay. Um, if, for example, if there was objectionable content, but they were advised to. I see. Um, and the record labels were kind of concerned that if they put a parental warning label that then young people wouldn't want to go buy those records. Mm -hmm. But of course, what's the best way to get a kid to want something? <laughs> Tell them they can't <laughs> have it. It's forbidden, it. you know, right? Sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was mostly brought about because of heavy metal and, and rock and roll. Okay. Um, and it was kind of targeting that specific genre. And I mean, you do still see explicit warnings today. Yeah. People aren't really buying CDs anymore, yeah. but if you go on like Apple Music, I know there'll be like a little warning box, that yeah. kind of thing. But yeah, you're right. You know, that often tends to be about lyrics, yeah. not uh, or swear words, cuss words, yeah. not so much around concepts, right? Like, yeah gun culture or misogyny or mm -hmm. violence, violence against women. Um, yeah, and, and these have been ongoing you know, philosophical conversations about what is, what is an artist's responsibility, yeah. right? And, and can music make people do violent things? Yeah. And then that goes back to Plato and the ancient Greeks and mm -hmm. you know, uh, medieval Middle Eastern philosophers too. So it's something that people have been talking about for centuries. Yeah. Um, I mean, they use it yeah. for like, in the military, right, to like boost up mm -hmm. the morales of the mm -hmm. soldiers. So I think yeah. it definitely must have some sort of impact, maybe minor or maybe major, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure. But I think there's going to be some, some sort of impact. That's true. I mean, music definitely affects yeah. people. Um, and also there's something, too, about when you listen to music with a group of people yeah. or you sing a piece of music with a group of people, mm -hmm. um, music kind of creates this sense of unity, right? Yeah. Or like, well, I'm not just one person, I'm part of this big group. Yeah. And that can be used for positive effect, mm -hmm. right? Um, creating that sense of community or having a religious or spiritual experience. Yeah. <coughs> and the same thing, it can be used for um, violence, yeah. you know, or, and hatred. Yeah. Um, you can have 
Nazi songs, yeah. you can have fascist songs. Yeah. And so, yeah, and, and that's something that's not just unique to music. I mean, we see it in, in art and theater and yeah. literature as well, but I feel like there's almost something about music that makes it even more powerful. Yeah. Maybe something about it is sort of subtle, yeah. right? We don't always realize how it's affecting yeah. us. Um, or with art, you can close your eyes, or <laughs> you know, literature, you cannot read it, but with music, it's there, so. Yeah. yeah. And, and I talk about like music going back as well. Uh, we see, and you talk about uh, like womanizing and showing, showing today at times in the music. And I want to know, like, in terms of history mm -hmm. as well, that was it always there? Because we, well, our parents always tell us back in the day, this music, it wasn't that bad or whatever. And from where we learn about history as well, like uh, a lot of Sufis, cause I, that, that's mm -hmm. where I kind of learned back. So it's like a lot of Sufism is like, does not have the same things that we have today, but that's only one area. So I want to know from the historic yeah. aspect, has this culture of like one, of course, is one aspect of music that's like uh, music towards maybe God or maybe towards mm -hmm. like a tr true love. But has the other side always been there like from mm -hmm. the very beginning, like in terms of like, uh, I guess, partying and drug or whatever? Sure. Has it always been there? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. Music can be used for so many different yeah. purposes, like you said. You know, one can be religious or spiritual. Um, it can be used um, to kind of create a sense of community. It can be used for education. And then one of the things, of course, music is used for is entertainment, yeah. right? And in kind of the um, early 1900s, we see kind of the rise of mass-marketed popular music, okay. where all of a sudden you could buy recordings of your favorite songs. You didn't necessarily need to go to a live performance, or yeah. you didn't necessarily need to have someone around you who could play it on yeah. an instrument. Um, and sort of with the birth of mass marketed popular music and recordings, we start to see some yeah. of these issues, I right? See. And how do you get people to listen? Well, one thing is to kind of push the boundary, right? Or right. explore something that was previously taboo. Um, and so in the early history of rock and roll, we see uh, record companies taking rhythm and blues records mm -hmm. and marketing them as rock and roll to white listeners. Yeah. And they were taboo because, oh, this is being created by black American musicians, That's right? True. My parents don't want me listening to this, so I want to listen to it more yeah. than anything <laughs> else, right? Um, and that was one way to push the boundary. Yeah. And then when we get sort of into the 70s, it's taught maybe making allusions to drugs, or the yeah. 60s, right? Like I psychedelic see. rock. Yeah. Um, and then the 1980s, things maybe getting a little bit more sexualized. We yeah. have artists like Madonna. Yeah. So we kind of see this steady progression now. I don't know, it is true today. I mean, there are certainly things said in songs and in images that, yeah, you wouldn't have heard yeah, okay. <laughs> in the 80s or the yeah. 90s. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I think personally it's because when you want to keep music you know, something like exciting or fresh yeah. or shocking, you're continuously pushing that envelope and that's how we got to here and we'll see where things go next. Um, but yeah, and it's interesting too, you know, that's some, oftentimes there are certain genres that are targeted more than yeah. others. Like in the 80s, it was heavy metal, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in the 90s and the 2000s, we see hip hop yeah. being targeted as like, oh, this is music that's you know talking about violence, that's being degraded towards women. Not that those things aren't happening in other uh, genres, yeah. it's just that's where kind of the popular yeah. consciousness is focusing their attention. Um, so yeah. It's, it seems like it's been like more effective, like a, a more of a capitalistic, uh, mm -hmm. capitalistic, uh, I guess, economy as well. Mm -hmm. And then going back to like I guess the roots of history of music, uh, we talk about men getting a lot of credit for uh, their compositions, and then women practicing music a lot of, like eternally to them mm -hmm. privately. And I, I was always curious, when does folk music, the stuff that women sing mm -hmm. at like the home for the kids, or even men sing at home, when does folk music kind of go toward, become classical music? Where does the transition mm. happen? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that folk music was kind of incorporated more into mass marketed popular mm -hmm. culture um, was in these nationalist movements of the 1900s. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that governments were like, okay, well, we want people to feel like they belong to this nation, yeah. right? So we need to create a sense of national cultural, national identity. How can we do that? Well, we'll do it through the arts. Yeah. And we'll take folk music 
and will encourage composers to incorporate folk music into their compositions, will incorporate folk music into popular music, mm -hmm. right? Um, so kind of use it in that way. Yeah. Um, and in the United States, we also see a folk, an interest in folk music and the folk revival in the 1960s and 1970s as kind of a reaction to electric guitars mm -hmm. and rock and roll and saying, okay, well, this music is going to be more immediate. It's going to be more focused on being, um, uh, you know, closer to your audience, yeah. right? And we're going to look to music of the past as inspiration. So mm -hmm. usually um, folk songs from Appalachia, um, sort of Irish, English, um, Scottish influences, yeah. um, and then sort of taking those songs and then using them as the basis to create new ones. Okay, I see. Yeah. And then just wrapping it up almost, uh, yeah. one of the questions I, I was, uh, want to like get out there is, for me, there's, there's a huge pressure on um, becoming like an engineer. I mean, I love being an engineer, yeah. but I just want to like uh, get like a more, uh, a different viewpoint on why should, it, what are the career paths options for someone that's interested in arts? Is there like a way to live it or a living, like, or, on a living? Mm -hmm. What are the options, and why should someone pursue uh, the field in arts in general? Not, not only music, but in general in arts. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. I mean, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, if you are interested in pursuing a career in the arts or having an aspect of your career be in the arts, yeah. right? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Yeah. Um, it's good to keep an open mind and be interested in doing many different things. Mm -hmm. So a lot of folks who make a living as an artist, whether it be a musician, visual artist, yeah. photographer, they do different things, right? So maybe they teach. Maybe they do some private studio work um, for musicians. Maybe you can play wedding gigs. You can yeah. play corporate parties, right? Um, you can give lessons. Um, you can do sound editing or yeah. some sound engineering, right? So getting as many different skills as you can um, and not being afraid to put yourself out there yeah. um, and you know make new connections, um, make new friends, yeah. explore new technologies ask questions yeah. right not being afraid to ask questions um, and yeah for someone you know, like yourself who you're an engineer you're yeah. on that path which is awesome because the world needs engineers <laughs> um, you can be involved in the arts by being a patron yeah. right so going to concerts supporting your favorite yeah. artists um, if you learn to play an instrument yeah. right you can join a group you don't have to play Carnegie Hall to yeah. be a performing musician right you can play at coffee shops you can get together and play with friends like just keeping music in your life for the joy of it, I think, um, is an option for everybody. And how much of a, a, a role can like a campus like CRC, this community college, mm -hmm. how much can, like, let's say I'm, I'm already graduated and I want to just take some classes and learn mm -hmm. or have opportunity to just sort of place where I can record stuff, how much can yeah. a campus like CRC help individuals? Oh, yeah, community college is the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> CRC is the way to go because we're accessible, mm -hmm. we're affordable, and we're here, yeah. right? And we're approachable folks. So for example, um, we have several certificate programs. Yeah. They're low units, and they're really focused on acquiring a specific set of skills. Yeah. So in our music department, we have a composition certificate. Mm -hmm. You can take a few classes, and then you'll get the skills needed to kind of jumpstart your activities, your yeah. professional career as a composer. Yeah. Um, we have an independent music instructor certificate. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in taking or giving music lessons, yeah. the certificate is going to help you get started doing yeah. that. Um, if you just want to take a couple classes, you want to learn a new instrument, you can come learn to play piano in this beautiful room. <laughs> um, you can take beginning guitar, yeah. right? Um, or you can take a history class. Yeah. Oftentimes what's really awesome, and one of the things I love the most about teaching at CRC is I have students from all, of all ages yeah. and of all backgrounds. And I love on a few occasions I've had folks who are retired. Mm -hmm and they love music. Yeah. And so they come and they take a class with yeah. me. And it's amazing, it's so fun. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're here, come to CRC, you yeah. know. <laughs> and just final two questions. Uh, yeah. What advice would you give to yourself like as an 18 year old, <laughs> looking back? <laughs> oh, wow, oh gosh, uh, so much, so, much. <laughs> so many things. Um, oh, overall, I guess I would just say to, um, you know, remember to enjoy music. Yeah. Of course I do, but oftentimes there's a lot of shame involved, right? Yeah. Like, oh, 
this other person can play this viola part better than I can. I, I must be a bad musician, okay, right? Yeah. Or, oh, this other person got into that conference and I didn't. Yeah. I must not be good at this. So I guess I'd just go back in time. I'd give myself a hug and I'd yeah. say, have some confidence. Don't worry about it. Yeah. It's all part of the, part of the process, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to have everything perfect now. Yeah. Um, just keep going and yeah. <laughs> have a little bit of faith in yourself. and. Um, the process that matters. Yeah, yeah, it's a process. Also, floss. You should floss yeah. your teeth. <laughs> Tell my 18 year old self, get better at flossing. Um, and yeah, and, and just remember to be young and, and have fun. <laughs> have fun. <laughs> yeah. And final question uh, mm -hmm. just three things maybe you have in music, whether it or it can be any shows, music, any books yeah. that you are, three things that you recommend for audience that would like last maybe, oh. yeah, last, yeah, three things. Mm, okay. Um, let's see. So three things I would recommend in terms of like books or movies or even music artists, music, music artists. Songs. Okay, yeah. Um, for music artists, um, I would say if you haven't had a chance to um, listen to any music, well, okay, there's a lot, right? I love um, the music of Claude W.C. Okay. So if you're just interested at all in like some nice sounds um, or lo-fi music, I've recently gotten into lo-fi. Okay. It's kind of like a genre of hip hop. It's just so nice for being calming and relaxing. Check that out. Um, there's also um, a great um, uh, hip R&B artist, okay. Janae Aiko, um, who I found out about because of a student, yeah. and now I'm obsessed with all of her <laughs> albums, so I'd recommend yeah. those. I listen to those whenever I'm cooking. It's like, okay. I don't know something about it. I just yeah. feel like I'm making a music video <laughs> while I'm making dinner. Uh, so that's really great. Yeah, um, yeah. and in terms of books, um, there's a mystery series that I really, I love mysteries, uh -huh. um, and there's a mystery series, uh, uh, the Dr. Siri Mysteries, okay. S-I-R-I. It takes place in the 1970s uh -huh. in Laos, yeah. um, and Dr. Siri is a coroner, and he solves all these mysteries. But right. it's also kind of insight um, into the history of Laos and into Laotian culture, um, and they're really enjoyable, and yeah. they're, they're pretty quick. They're easy reads, too, and, um, and I love them. I read them a lot during the yeah. school year. <laughs> they're really comforting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, thank you for being on the show. Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, anything you'd like to add? Uh, what kind of music do you listen to mostly? Oh, what kind of music do I listen to mostly? Um, I listen to a lot of rock music. I just I have like a real passion for 60s and 70s rock. I think it's because I grew up listening to that. Yeah. Because uh, it was the only thing my dad would let us listen to in the car. <laughs> and I guess it sunk in. Um, I also listen to, um, I've been listening to more jazz recently. Yeah. And also trying to listen to more rock music from the 60s or 70s from other parts of the world. Yeah. Like recently, Spotify recommended an artist to me, and unfortunately I can't remember his name, but I can look. Um, and he's a singer, songwriter, guitarist. I just yeah. love him. He's from Japan. Beautiful melodies, yeah. beautiful guitar playing. Um, and yeah, I, I also um, listen to a lot of uh, classical music too, like I said. But I'm open to listening to music from all over the world, which is what, something I love about my world music class, yeah. is because students recommend things. So like, um, one of my kicks, like a thing I'm learning a lot about now is Bhangra, yeah. um, because so many of my students yeah. are like, you gotta check this out, you gotta check this yeah. out. Um, and I'm preparing a new uh, lesson to incorporate into world music yeah. next time I go to Bhangra. So I'm like, okay, I gotta learn more about this. Have you had any artists mm -hmm. in mind? Um, I just watched a documentary called Pump Up the Bhangra. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I listened to artists that I heard in that. Okay. But I don't know if you're fans, if you have any recommendations. <laughs> um, or if there are any artists I should I should learn more about. For Comments. Quality. Comments. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know, because yeah. um, I'm always trying to improve, uh, and just like for my own yeah. enjoyment. Yeah. I always felt jazz, I was envisioning it as like, Classical, very classical. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Is jazz like very classical type of music? Sometimes yeah. it can be. There are like different uh, genres, subgenres of jazz. Mm -hmm. I really love big band jazz, okay. which it kind of has more like a swing feel to it. Um, I really like that because it reminds me of my grandparents, I guess, because <laughs> I know this is the music that they listened to when they yeah. were young, and it makes me think of them. Um, yeah, there, and then there's some parts of jazz and like 
this is cool. I, I think it's neat what the musicians are doing, but I don't know if I want to like listen to it for relaxing, you know? Yeah. Like free jazz or acid jazz. I appreciate it for what it is and its merits, but it's not something I'm going to listen to on my own time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you like jazz? Or? I honestly don't know really what jazz truly yeah. really is. Oh, yeah. I, because I, I took a class with mm-hmm. Professor Holman. Okay, yeah. And yeah. he was, he was talking talk about jazz. He played some stuff. But I was like, this kind of something that seems like classical to me. So I wasn't really able to differentiate between either yeah, one of them. Yeah. And I mainly listen to uh, Punjabi music, so I don't listen mm-hmm. too much English stuff. Okay. So it's like, I'm not really sure. <laughs> what kind of Punjabi music? Uh, it's like, well, I, I don't know how to categorize it. It's like, yeah. hip, it's, it ha- they have like very hip hop type oh, of beats. Okay. Yeah. It's like yeah. hip-hop mixed with like folk and Debbie beats, they mix it together. Mm-hmm. So a lot okay. of times the instruments will be Western instruments, but the uh, but the composition will be like very really folk compositions they use mm-hmm. to like mix it together. Oh, instruments like the doll and... What's the instrument with one string? The dumbi. Dumbi. The dumbi. Dumbi. Yeah. Yeah. Dumbi, yeah. Dumbi, yeah. That's instrument I just yeah. learned about. Yeah. So a lot of the compositions are made on those. Like the hardest instruments. Yeah? Yeah. It lo- it's always the ones that look simple that are the hardest. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then, so they, they take out the compositions that are made, like, on those instruments, but then they apply, like, Western, like, trap beats and stuff mm-hmm. like that to them. The, those are the ones that are oh, okay. most popular right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. We'll leave some recommendations for you. Okay, cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I learned a little bit more about, like, um, oh, it was kind of a uh, similar thing, or an idea of combining sort of, like, folk music with... Um, Rock and uh, maybe you remember it from world music when we talk about the Mongolian. Oh, we talked about Mongolian music. Uh, maybe oh, I wasn't. I didn't teach it then. Um, it was a, there's this band <clears throat> from Mongolia called uh, the Who, uh-huh. and they take like, metal and rock and combine it with uh, Mongolian instruments. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, you have to leave me with some recommendations, yeah. please. I, th- I think yeah. it's because, uh, okay, there's, like, there's a huge um, migrant community of, of Punjabi music that's mm-hmm. like in Canada and stuff. So it's like an influence oh, of like Western yeah. c- on, on them and they make like Punjabi music from Canada or even oh, the US. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, when I was watching that documentary, they talked a lot about Punjabi music in London. Yeah. London and one other town that I can't remember was like outside of London. And they were like the two competing yeah. Bhangra scenes. And they make it sound like Bhangra was invented in London. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's a good documentary because it's yeah. like pretty short and really interesting. And the presenter is really good. Mm-hmm. But it, yeah, it's like pretty narrow focus. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I need to watch and learn more for sure. <laughs> but yeah, but that's where I learned about yeah. the Jumbi and some of the other instruments. Yeah, I love watching music documentaries. Yeah. yeah. Any recommendations yeah. other than that one? And that one was good. Um, there's one, um, about, uh, oh shoot, I'm trying to remember now. Um, oh, there's one about salsa music. Okay. I don't remember the title, but I'll look it up. That was pretty good. Yeah. And there are so many of them on YouTube, yeah, too. Yeah. You know, back in the day, we had to, like, go rent the DVD. <laughs> but now they're just all there. YouTube, yeah. Yeah, which is pretty great. Um, yeah, if you know of any. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we watch like a documentary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any final cool. thoughts? How's it? How's it? How's it to be on our show? It's good. It was fun. I hope I said okay yeah. things. No, perfect. Sometimes when I'm talking, yeah. I get so wrapped up in it that I'm like, wait a minute, am I making sense? Yeah. Um, We're also kind of also experimenting at the same, uh, going mm-hmm. at the same time. It's like it's my mm-hmm. first time like being in front of camera oh, doing yeah. the series, so it's also a new experience for me. Yeah. Too. yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, guys. Uh, if you guys like this like this video, like it. And if you guys want to keep watching the next episode, please subscribe. And comment uh, any rec- recommendations for me and uh, Professor Bibi. Yeah. And see you on the next one.